So like I said, we're going to do uh, a notice. Uh, <laughs> it's the next day. Uh, it's a little chilly out here in the garage. Uh, it's California chilly. Um, so that means it's like 55 degrees. Anybody else that's, you know, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'm spoiled. I know it. Uh, we pay sunshine tax, so, you know. We get good weather for the vast majority of the time, and um, we get good temperatures too. Nothing we gotta, you know, worry about. I don't have to shovel ice off my driveway or snow off the porch or any of that crap. And you know, I don't have to drive on snow and icy roads. It, it, come on. So, what we're gonna do is. Five rounds of once fired brass because it is slightly different than um, brand new brass. So up here are my cartridge cases. Five pieces of uh, once fired. These have been deprimed already. Um, no big deal there. Uh, these have been trimmed and deburred. Again, you know, just to make sure everything is good. <clears throat> so, we grab our, and these came out of the, um, these were soaked in a little bit of Simple Green and uh, warm water. Um, and then thrown in the uh, Sonic tank to uh, clean them. Um. Sonic cleaners don't do as good of a job as you would think. Uh, they are tremendously good for getting into uh, real, real difficult places to um, to clean. But um, the secret to uh, proper Sonic cleaning and getting the proper um, level of cleanliness and um, that you want out of your uh, cleaner is going to be the type of um, cleaner that you use, the, the type of chemical that you use in the in the uh, bath. So um, you can you can buy the stuff that's um, dedicated for uh, taking care of cleaning brass and stuff like that, or you can just mix up your own stuff. Whatever you're going to get varying results. It it, it all depends on what you want. Um, personally. Um, if I was going to try it, I'm going to try to use something that's relatively inexpensive um, because we do this stuff in small batches. You're really not going to recycle it, and uh, um, you're not going to recycle it and try and filter it and reuse it, um, especially black powder. Black powder is pretty much a one-time go, um, especially if you're doing more than about 30 to 50 pieces of brass. Um, if you're doing like 100, 200 pieces of brass after a match, something like that, your water is going to come out absolutely black as night. 100% um, uh, sewage water when you're done because that's just the nature of the beast with uh, black powder is the residue, you know. Um, so those cases are now primed. Nothing different than... Uh, Prime and regular cases. Um, I'm going to get my, again, we're going to throw the over powder uh, wad in here. Um, actually, no. Failed to mention, uh, these cases were also annealed. Um, you've already seen the annealing process. Um, I'm not going to show it to you again. It's, you know, take it over to the amp annealer, push the button, drop them in, pull it out, done. Um, you guys don't just need to be bored to death seeing that a second time. Um, so, but they, I do anneal uh, every firing. Um, why do I do that? I do that because it's easier for me to remember that they're annealed and not sitting there trying to keep track of 
well, did I anneal this firing, or did I, or do I need to anneal this firing, or um, do I need to wait for the next firing? Or, and I'm not going to keep notes in my. <clears throat> I'm not going to keep notes in my um, uh, my loads um, or in, in my brass. The only thing that I do um, for how I keep notes on my brass is I do stuff like this. I write on the uh, thing, or I'll drop a card in. Um, I'll do something like this. Uh, whatever was in here was annealed, sized, and trimmed. Done. I know where, where I'm at with that. And that's because I, I don't have a whole lot of time in a day, so um, I run my stuff through in batches. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's brass laying here, there's brass laying over here, there's brass there. There's a whole cabinet of brass out on my uh, patio, breezeway, whatever the hell you want to call that thing. Um, and that's just, the way, that's just the way it works for me. Find something that works, shit. Find something that works for you and, and do it that way. Um, that's the easiest way for me. If you can, if you can take your brass and run it through an entire start to finish cycle and have it so that it is ready to load um, you know from one bin to the next go for it um, and you can prime brass and you can leave uh, um, you can leave brass uh, primed um, in uh, you can leave brass primed um, in the cases, and um, it's not going to hurt them to leave brass primed for a, a good amount of time. It just, you know, same, same, same story with uh, um, keep them in a container that's um, going to be, um, you know, relatively airtight and keep the humidity levels down, things of that nature. Normal precautions, normal precautions, nothing major. <clears throat> so, We've got our, and we're not going to use that drop tube. See, I'm already forgetting. I'm thinking about. I'm, I'm going to. I was going to grab my uh, little funnel here for doing um, my smokeless loads to uh, drop the powder. And it's like, no, 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 no. You're doing black powder, buddy. You got to put this through the drop tube. And again, that's how new I am to this stuff. Is I, I I'm not in the habit of grabbing the right tools for the job, I have to remind myself to do this and do this right. So, uh, again, we're just going to go 102 grains. Um, we're going to go 102 grains and uh, call it good. Yeah. Overshot the snot out of that. So the difference is you don't have to size, and forgive me for not being able to hit a number here. I haven't even gotten a full cup of coffee down me yet, so I'm kind of still out of sorts this morning. I need my bloody coffee to start the day. But uh, we don't full length size our brass. Um, a second time, we use fire form, <clears throat> and uh, so you don't have to you don't have to size the brass again. Um, oh, and that's the other thing I didn't mention with the um, with the new brass. Notice I didn't run it through a belling uh, die. Um, you'll you'll get a you'll get a belling um, die. With your with your reloading dies, that's for um, that's for reloading uh, cases that are um, groove diameter. Yeah, two or six, that will do. So, bore diameter, groove diameter. Let's go over that real quick. <clears throat> groove diameter is going to be your standard, like a We'll use a 308 for example. 308 barrel is a 300 bore 
three zero zero inches bore should be <laughs> um, and with a groove diameter of 0 0.308 and a groove diameter bullet is going to be a 308 diameter bullet that is standard in uh, smokeless black powder and you'll hear the common practice the common practice with black powder uh, with lead bullets <clears throat> um, not even with black powder but the common practice with um, uncoated lead or even coated lead uh, just plain lead unjacketed bullets the common practice is to go one thousandths over one to two thousandths over groove diameter so that means your 308 is going to have a 309 or a 310. Um, your 45, instead of having a 451 for like a 45 ACP, it's going to be a 452. Um, <clears throat> and that's done that way to ensure that there's enough lead fill in the grooves to give you a proper gas seal in the bore of the gun. Sorry for the pauses there, trying to read a number and focus on what I'm doing and talk at the same time. Can't walk and chew gum. But, uh, so when we... The problem with uh, patching the groove, or excuse me, patching the groove, well, patching the groove, patching the groove um, is using a, uh, a bullet that is large enough that where when you wrap the, uh, the, pa the paper patch around it, it's going to patch it up to groove diameter or slightly over. Um, so the problems with using a groove diameter bullet, patched or greased, however you want to get there, problems with that is, is you lose powder capacity or you have to compress the ever-living snot out of your powder charge. Almost there. You lose powder capacity, or you have to compress the snot out of your powder charge to ensure that your bullet doesn't bottom out in the lands of the barrel. Now the barrels on these uh, Shilohs, um, at one point in time, um, the barrels on the Shilohs had what was called a paper patch chamber. I don't know the whole backstory to it, <clears throat> but I do know that uh, Shiloh made a terrible mistake um, with, uh, with, with how they were chambering their, their rifles for a short period of time. Um, and I don't know how old, I think they're all Farmingdale, uh, guns. I don't think any of the ones were done out of uh, big timber this way. Um, don't quote me on that. I, I don't know the full backstory on it. But anyway, um, what the what the issue was is somebody got the bright idea to put a bunch of free bore in the uh, chamber um, to allow clearance for uh, a paper patched bullet to sit in the chamber and sit in there with the free bore and um, not have to worry about seating that bullet so far back in um, so that the uh, ogive on the uh, bullet doesn't um, contact the rifling. Well, that's not how the rifles were made traditionally. Traditionally, they were made with no... Um, lead, no throat, no freebore, none. 
Um, I've done a chamber cast of my rifle, and I've also bore scoped it. Um, the chamber is cut. It hits a shoulder. Uh, there's a little bit of a square lip, probably maybe like five thousandths of a step. And then it goes right into what looks like a 45 degree chamfer and then right out into the rifling lead, uh, lead in and done. Uh, I don't know what their lead in is for the, uh, for the chamber. I'd have to take another cast and put it under the microscope and accurately measure it. I really don't care what it is. It works. Um, but there's no lead in. There's no free bore on that chamber. So you either have to use a grease groove bullet that has a step, uh, dual diameter basically, has a step on the bullet, you know, so that the bullet nose is much smaller in diameter than the riding surfaces, and then you seat those riding surfaces, you, you, seat, the, you, you seat that um, bearing surface area uh, into, the, into the case so that it's not in contact with the lands of the, um, of the uh, barrel. Um, you do that, or you paper patch with a dual diameter bullet, which uh, that's written up in Kenny Wasserberger's book. Uh, he's got a new design for a dual diameter bullet. The, the, the large diameter of the bullet is at the rear 400 thousandths, and everything ahead of that is your normal um, bore diameter uh, paper patch. And... The rear 400 thousandths is your groove diameter paper patch. So I may buy um, one of those uh, bullet molds and give that a shot and see if that's going to be any better than what I'm doing here. Um, I need to learn how to make this work first before I uh, go trying and um, throwing money at a problem that is entirely based on my skill level and not the gun. Um, I've got to learn how to make good loads. I've got to learn how to look through the sights properly. i got to learn how to get a good sight picture, uh, proper follow-through, proper fundamentals behind the gun, learning to put the barrel back in. You know, there's a whole... You know, the, big, the biggest thing, a, di a difference between shooting black powder and shooting smokeless is smokeless for match grade accuracy is you free float the barrel and you don't let anything touch the barrel. Uh, black powder cartridges, you rest the barrel on a pair of shooting sticks and oh by the way, make sure you put the, make sure you put the barrel back in the same place on the shooting sticks every bloody time. And there's a whole process of figuring out where to rest the barrel on the shooting sticks, at what point on the barrel to rest the barrel on the shooting sticks to make it work and it's just like, it's so counterintuitive to what I'm used to, it's it's insane. Um, so it's just it's just another one of the like I said, the learning curve is is steep on this stuff. It's really it's just it's the whole process of paper patching, the whole process of shooting these black powder guns, the whole process of building the loads. It's not difficult. It's and it's, and it's not any more. Um, it's not any more uh, involved than doing smokeless loads. It's the bloody learning curve. The learning curve is freaking steep because it's this stuff is entirely different than shooting um, loads for smokeless and building match grade ammo for smokeless. It's completely different. Now I'm going to press these uh, veg fiber wads down against the powder charge without compressing the powder charge. Same, same. Same, same like we did with these guys. Same thing. The only thing we're doing different is we are not sizing the brass. Brass does not need to be sized. The only time you run um, the brass back through a full length sizer is when um, the cases become uh, difficult to chamber. I would highly suggest that you figure that out if they're going to chamber or not for you before you go to a match um, or pack enough ammo that uh, that does not present itself as an issue. Um, but 
lowering the uh, handle all the way down on the press and I'm going to dial in powder seat it just bottomed out and like we did before I'm going to eyeball about three-eighths of an inch not trying to block the view of the camera and I'm going to go down until it stops just give out a little and we can then take a measurement but yeah you want to make sure you've got this stuff um, 550 so 550 total compression um, and we started with 300 so that's only uh, 250 100 200 yeah that's a quarter that's a quarter of an inch of compression right there so it needs a little more compression um, it needs a little more compression I'm just gonna eyeball I'm gonna eyeball that yeah I could be measuring um, this is just for a demo I highly suggest that if you're building match ammo, yeah, um, measure and make sure where you're at. Um, see, now we're at 625, so that was another 75 thousandths deeper. So that's uh, going to be 250, 300, that's 325 uh, thousandths. Um, so now I can actually um, take a measurement here 825 2 inches 825 and let's see where were we at again here 625 I'm breaking out the calculator And then we were at what, 250 here? 300. All right. 0.625 minus 0.3 <clears throat> equals 325. So we want to go another uh, 55 thousandths. Another 55 thousandths deeper to get the 380. I think 820. So I'll clear that. 820 minus 0 0.055. 765. I can just set my calipers. 765. dial past and then dial back up until I just touch that will be close enough for what I'm doing here you know demo um, that's fine doesn't have to be bloody perfect but I would suggest do the stuff as, as accurately as you possibly can for all your match grade stuff take the time do it right do it right the first time spend it you know um, again, this is just a, a demonstration of what I'm doing, and these rounds, I'm, this is only demo. Um, I don't even know if this load is all that accurate, which is why I'm only doing five rounds, because I don't want to be wasting components. Bloody hell, primers right now are, you know, if you're, if you're one of those guys spending $250 for a thousand primers on Gun Broker, you need to freaking stop. Okay, all you're doing is, is, is feeding the problem. We need to get these damn primers back down to 50 bucks a box. I'm not paying five times what they were just because that's what idiots are willing to try and sell the shit for. And you guys need to freaking stop that shit. That just, that just irritates the snot out of me. Oh, I don't, I don't have a problem paying, you know, $2 a round for 9 millimeter. I will slap the snot out of you. God dang it. All you're doing is causing... You're perpetuating the problem. You're keeping the problem going. It's like, what the hell? 
and we got a battery. Nice! Alright, battery's changed. So, anyway. Uh, yeah. Um, I know you guys gotta have components. I know you guys gotta have, um, stuff to shoot. Um, if you can wait it out, wait it out. Um, but, for God's sakes, don't be paying these guys five times what it costs for a box of primers. Um, that's just ridiculous. And all you're doing is creating this, this false market that these guys are, 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 are selling and, and, and reaping, you know, they're just taking advantage of you. And they're taking advantage of all of us because now there's a supply of primers out there that nobody can freaking buy because guess what? We can't freaking afford them. I'm not, I will sell my guns before I pay $250 for the thousand primers. This is bullshit. I'll go back to Flintlock for crying out loud. I'll use god dang rocks for freaking primers. Screw you guys. Bloody bullshit. So, rant over. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we just made our final adjustment. We should have um, proper bullet seat now. Or, excuse me, bullet seat. Jesus. Primer compression. And there we go. Now we're 50... 53, 55 thousandths more than where we were, which is right where we needed to be. So, there's that guy. We'll do these real quick. Make sure you're not bashing the lips of your brass, the mouth of your brass as you get it up in there, ah, like that. Gently, gently, gently. Because this brass is very thin at the mouth and it doesn't take much um, misguiding to tweak and bend, um, distort the, uh, the mouth of the brass there. And it's one of my, one of my primers fell, nothing out of the case, so out of the, out of the, um, primer catcher there. So, back to the polywad. Again, Walter's Wads. I think you can buy direct from him, but um, I would just buy from uh, Buffalo Arms and be done. Um, so I'm pushing these in by hand. Be careful. If you ain't got a lot of callus built up on your fingers, this brass can be sharp and it will cut you. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing this, use the back of a screwdriver, a wooden dowel, something like that. My hands are, I work with my hands every day, so um, doing this ain't going to hurt me one bit. Wooden dowel again, I'm going to just press down until I hit the top of that uh, veg fiber wad. Press these down. Grab the eighth inch felts. And since I punched these out myself, there are a few that get mispunched. Um, so I have a nice round one like that. And then I end up with stuff like this. And stuff like this, we don't want to use. Um, I tossed these in when I was doing them just because I was too lazy to sort out while I was making them. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, you don't want to use that because then you'll get an uneven, um, the, the felt will compress. And if there's any lack of pressure or any open area where the lead can upset into, it's going to. Um, so 
your wads need to be round as as you know as close to perfectly round without any you know corner corners cut off of a circle no um, without any edges like that uh, relieved that are going to cause you issues because um, it is you know it's going to cause a problem so now to our paper patch grab five bullets these are exposed lead um, so wash your hands when you're done um, you know these notice they fit a little loose a little looser in here than these and that's because these are fire formed and they're not um, there's more compression on this guy to this guy isn't there yeah a little bit yeah so we went 280 compression on this so this has got 380 on it so eh whatever we'll give it a shot we'll see but that's it um, there's, there's a little difference it's a little easier it's a less process of um, shooting fire form uh, brass as compared to shooting uh, new brass um, and every once in a while you need to check it and measure it to see uh, if it's if it's starting to if the cases are starting to, to lengthen and you need to keep them trimmed back to your your chamber dimension and then you can get an accurate feel um, for uh, what a sized case is compared to what a fire formed case is when it comes to how much the length changes from what you started with to what you ended up with because they will shrink a little bit when you um, fire form them they will do that but you do want that fire formed brass as close to um, uh, your chamber length as possible and what the what the technique with that is is you want to take your your fire formed brass should be um, able to just chamber and then the final uh, mild thumb pressure to fully seat the case in the chamber and then close your breech block. Um, you shouldn't have to force anything home uh, on these rifles um, and you should just have gentle thumb pressure on the case only, not a loaded cartridge, just the case only. So that'll tell you that you're actually hitting that um, that that chamfer, uh, hitting that shoulder just a touch, and it's getting right at the edge, and you just shove it in just that extra teeny bit, and it goes. Um, you don't want to have it, it. It needs to be close, but you know, don't have it too long. Um, and it's it's just a real. Fun, that's that's one of the real fine adjustments um, you know smokeless powder loading they tell you you know uh, cut everything back 10 thou away from the uh, away from the uh, maximum overall length which is still probably a sixty thousandths of an inch from the edge of the um, chamber before it hits the uh, before it hits the throat and the lead in and everything going down um, black powder cartridge we want those cartridges right just bottomed out on that shoulder if we possibly can inside the uh, inside the chamber right before the, the rifling starts. Um, that's where we want it because we don't want any place for that uh, bullet to upset into and then have to shear itself off or swedge itself back down to go through the bore. We want, we want as minimal upset on the bullet as possible, as minimal disturbance and distortion of that bullet as possible as it's going through the barrel. And which is which is really why um, you do things like this, where um, that bullet is sticking into the uh, rifled uh, portion of the barrel, very very uh, deeply in there, and um, you, you you just have so much more um, you have so much more uh, engagement and rifling in there um, than you do. Uh, with a grease groove or anything like that and um, it, it really minimizes the upset of the bullet uh, really reduces the distortion which is why these bullets actually for the time period um, 
were exceptionally accurate and still are. Um, you know, to to think about somebody who um, has a uh, a rifle that uh, was designed around the 1860s and refined into the 1870s and 1880s, and uh, we didn't see any massive improvements until we got into smokeless powder and copper jackets. Um, and these bullets, for the size that they are, um, paper jackets keep up with uh, paper jackets keep up with 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 uh, jacketed stuff like it's no big deal. Um, again, appreciate it. Sorry for the long wind. Sorry for. Uh, going off on tangents, my stupid little rants, my pauses and all that crap, uh, my misuse of terms like calling a sonic cleaner, a sonic welder, um, things of that nature. Uh, I, I appreciate um, appreciate you guys watching, appreciate you guys supporting me. Um, I don't get any money for doing this. This is just purely uh, educational. I don't do... I don't have enough subscribers or anything like that to uh, generate any kind of um, ad revenue. I don't care, which is why I don't have a lot of videos, is because I don't have the time to do this stuff. Uh, you know, daughter's got Saturday school because she missed the day because we pulled her out of school to go to uh, 29 Palms to go shoot um, a match. So she's got to go make up her time for last semester. I had, I had actually had plans to. Uh, Go to the desert uh, today and do some uh, and do some testing on the uh, on the rifle. And uh, while I was out there, I was going to shoot my um, uh, Walker, my uh, Uberti Walkers. Um, I was going to give those a shot, but well, um, she's got Saturday school, so I can't go do that. Uh, so I'm just going to edit videos and. I might make another video on uh, how to do the paper patching, and then that'll be the that'll be the series of these, and, um, and that's it for now. But uh, yeah, if you guys got anything uh, got anything out of this, you know, I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. However you wanna, you know, and uh, um, if you guys got any suggestions. Other than uh, you, you need better lighting, you need to clean up your shop, you need better equipment. You, yeah, well, guess what? This is all I got, and this ain't getting any better. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, take care, and we'll see you on the next one. I have no bloody idea when that's going to be. Have a good one.